This is the story of Iberia Flight 933. On the 17th of December 1972, a DC-10 named Costa Brava was going to fly all the way from Madrid's Barajas Airport to Boston Logan International Airport. The plane had 153 passengers and 14 crew members on board. At about 3.54 p.m., the plane was getting close to Boston, and the controllers cleared the plane to get down to 3,000 feet. The controller gave flight 933 vector to intercept the localizer to runway 33 left. At this point, they were 9 miles from the outer marker, and minutes later, flight 933 was handed over to the tower controllers at Boston. As soon as flight 933 was in contact with the tower, they got some bad news. The runway visual range system was out of commission, but the visibility was 3 quarters of a mile with low winds. So, not too bad in the grand scheme of things. This plane should be able to land pretty soon. Within minutes of that, the plane was lined up with the runway and the autopilot was engaged. The autopilot was managing speed and heading of the plane, but the plane was prepped for landing. As the plane got closer, the controllers cleared the plane to land. The braking action on the runway was fair to poor, but that didn't really concern the pilots. The braking action could have been better, but since the runway was more than 10,000 feet long, stopping should be no problem. As the plane broke through 300 feet, the captain disconnected the autopilot. Then, the approach lights came into view, and they were to the right of the plane a bit. The approach lights were to the plane's 1 or 2 o'clock. The first officer said, lights to the right, to which the captain responds with, lights in sight. As the plane was put into a slight right-hand turn, the flight engineer called minimum decision height. The captain decided to continue with the landing. The captain thought that the plane was a bit too low, but he thought that he could still make the approach and decided to continue. He pushed the throttle a bit forward to compensate for the plane's low altitude, but despite that, the first officer and the flight engineer were telling the captain that the plane was too low. As Flight 933 was landing, an Air Canada plane was waiting to take off, and the captain of the Air Canada plane said that the DC-10 was too low to recover. The plane was, quote, desperately low. In the cockpit, whatever the captain was doing to save the plane was not working. Within a few seconds, the flight engineer rapidly said 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, as fast as he could, and then the plane struck the approach lights. In the tower, the approach lighting system audio alarm was activated. On the radio frequency, someone said, Iberia 933, we have an accident. The controller saw a trail of fire behind the plane, along with an explosion. He then reached for the crash alarm as soon as he could. The DC-10 lifted off again after losing its right-hand gear. The captain could no longer see the runway, and he pushed the control column forward, and the plane then settled down back on the runway. Hard. The left side of the plane then burst into flames. After that, the plane then came to a stop. Thankfully, no one on board the aircraft was hurt, and everyone walked away from the crash. But Flight 933 had left a trail of destruction in its wake. The approach lights to the runway were destroyed, and the runway had taken a beating. But it was nothing that couldn't be fixed. Right after the crash, the localizer and the glide slopes were tested. This seemed like a good idea because the plane was really low on approach. But the thing is, after all the tests, they found out that the beacons were within tolerances. So, that wasn't a cause of the crash. But that being said, the charts clearly stated that the glide slope was not usable below 200 feet, and that's something to keep in mind. So to figure out what had happened, they did the next best thing. They got a simulator and programmed in the conditions of that day, and got five pilots to fly a few approaches to the airport. In each of these simulated landings, they noticed that when the autopilot was disconnected at 200 feet, the rate of descent of the giant jet would spike all the way to 1150 feet per minute. Now, that's very fast. They also realized that the pilots only had a short 6 second window to apply corrective measures. If they didn't do that, then the plane would come crashing down well before the threshold of the runway. But what was really interesting is that in none of the simulator sessions did they get the plane to be not lined up with the runway. You remember on how the accident approached they couldn't really get the plane lined up with the runway? Well, no matter what they did in the simulator, they couldn't get that to happen in the sim. However, none of the pilots had any issues aligning the plane with the runway. This led the investigators to one culprit, low-level wind shear. Wind shear is very simple, but very deadly. You see, 
Sometimes the direction of the wind can change for a very short period of time or distance. If the change is drastic enough, then in very rare cases, pilots may have trouble controlling the plane. In even rarer cases, the plane can crash. Now, that's an oversimplification, but that's the general idea. Here's the thing, though. This is the 1970s, and much research has not been done into the effects of wind shear on planes. But they knew that when getting into the wind shear, the pilot would have to apply greater than normal descent rates to keep the plane on glide. Then, as you pierce more through the wind shear, the airspeed would rise, and so would the lift. Thus, you would have to counter that to keep the plane on glide, which you do by pulling back on power. Once you get out of the wind shear, you must add back the power or else you risk crashing into the runway. Did Flight 933 fly into a wind shear event though? The investigators pulled weather data from the day to see if there really was a wind shear event. They found out that the winds were in flux around the 1,000 foot area. The flight data recorder of the DC-10 showed that within a few seconds of Flight 933 hitting 500 feet in altitude, the winds on the plane went from an 18-knot tailwind to a 3.3-knot headwind. That's more than a 21-knot change in a few seconds. The flight data recorder also showed the telltale signs of a wind shear that we talked about before. But everything looked okay until the plane hit 500 feet, and then things started to go wrong. The plane rose above the glide slope, just as predicted, and like expected, the nose was slightly pitched down and thrust was pulled. By 260 feet, the plane was back on the glide, and the nose was raised slightly. But the plane was falling fast, and it fell pretty fast all the way to the decision height. At this point, the approach should have been abandoned, as the glide slope was no longer viable. But the captain did not do that. At this point, the plane was in a low thrust condition, and a low pitch condition, and ever so slightly to the left of the threshold. Now, two factors came together to doom the plane. One, the plane had just gotten out of a wind shear, and so it was a bit vulnerable. And if you remember, this is when the captain decided to switch over from automatic controls to manual ones. He also went from instrument flying to visual flying. The transition delayed the reactions of the pilots to the effects of the wind shear. And in this state, when the plane was oh so vulnerable, you really couldn't afford that delay. These two factors allowed a high rate of descent to occur and they were able to replicate this in the simulator. Right now, the captain needed to add power, but some of his sensory signals were being denied. The far end of the runway was obscured by fog, so he could not gauge the position of the plane with respect to the runway. Making matters worse, the runway was not equipped with a VASI or a vertical speed indicator. You know the red slash white things on the slide of the runway? Yeah, those things. Had those been there, the captain would have had an in-your-face warning that this plane was too low. Thus, since his visual perception was not alarming enough, he might not have had the immediate urge to add power and stabilize the plane. As we saw before, he only had a small window of time to do exactly that. From how Flight 933 ended up, you can probably deduce that he did not do that in time. Adding to all of this, his visuals were telling him the need for immediate lateral correction that needed to be made. Keep in mind, the plane was not lined up with the runway, and therefore he chose to do that over arresting the descent of the plane that he was in charge of. Another minor thing to note here is that the lights of the approach were a little bit too high. Wide-body airplanes did not have a lot of clearance when they landed on runway 3 through left, even on the best of days. So when things were less than ideal, it was no surprise that the plane flew into the lights, causing a major accident. I would love to show you pictures of the crash, but they're all copyrighted. So please do look them up the next time you have nothing to do. What's also interesting is that the floor of the plane buckled under the stress of the crash, and some people at the back had to escape through a gash in the ceiling. But the interesting thing is that the floor buckled in more or less the same spot where the floor of American Airlines Flight 96 cracked. If you want a video about that, let me know in the comments below. Like a lot of the accidents that are covered on this channel, this accident perfectly shows how safety is improved as a result of this accident. During this investigation, they were not sure about the effects that wind shear had on airplanes. Today, that is not the case. Today, we have specialized radar called Doppler radar that can detect wind shear long before it's a danger to any airplanes. And many planes have onboard radars that can detect wind shear before the plane even gets near it. So, don't worry about flying safe. If you want to watch another video about a plane crashing in Boston, then boy do I have the right video for you. 
You can find the link to Delta Airlines Flight 723 on your screen right about now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will see you guys next time. Stay safe.